Welcome to Ready to Mosh, a podcast all about rock, metal and alternative music. I'm Kev P. And I'm Gem G. Each episode will bring you the latest news, talk about new releases and review gigs and festivals that we've been to. There'll be a smattering of guest interviews and a lot of random chat. As well as podcasts, you can also find us on Twitter and Instagram. Just search at Ready to Moshcast. Hello and welcome to Ready to Mosh. Hello. Hello. Episode... 55. All the fat. Yeah, I had to think about that. That's because of the mini mosh in the middle oh, of the week. Yeah. Confuses us. Yeah, it's thrown me. But it's a full episode now. It is. Yeah. Because it's Monday. It's in Monday. Theory. In theory. In your world, it's Monday, not in yeah. ours. Assuming that you're one of the listeners who listens on a Monday. Yeah. <laughs> could be any day. <laughs> it could be. Yeah. All right. Let's crack on with the news then. Right. I've got a couple of items. Go on then. First one, I've got some ghost news. Well, there's a surprise. I think it's the first time I've had ghost news this year. Mm. Pretty sure. Legit okay. ghost news, not just me scratching at a ghost news so, yeah. so they have announced a new EP to be released on the 18th of May called Phantomime. And the first single from it, Jesus He Knows Me, a cover of the Genesis song, was released on Easter Sunday. And it's fucking terrible. Speak for yourself. So it was preceded with a half-hour call-in session on YouTube with Jim DeFrock, and then the video and song were launched straight after, with the video having an explicit warning on it. Yeah, I, I quite like the video. It's like an extreme version of the Genesis one. Yeah, it's yeah, not not for the faint-hearted. If you're easily offended, don't watch it, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, you don't like the audio, do you? No, because I've, I've said many times before, like when somebody covers a song, I want them to do it their kind of way, but he sounds just too close to the original. That's pointless to me. Well, I think it sounds a lot heavier and a lot faster than the original. There's a lot more layers in the music. Right? I think the guitar's heavier. Yeah. I will give you that. Mm. But it just mm. doesn't really do much for me. Okay, well, I've been listening to it a lot. No surprise. <laughs> no surprise, yeah. The other tracks on the EP, they're all covers. They are See No Evil by Television. Hanging Around by The Stranglers, Phantom of the Opera, which is the Iron Maiden version, not the musical, because there was some debate <laughs> over which it would be beforehand, because Tobias is a fan of the musical, so it could have gone either way. And finally, We Don't Need Another Hero by Tina Turner. I can't even imagine what that sounds no. like. No. But yeah, it'll be interesting, so um, I'm sure we'll hear more about that after its release. And interestingly, we don't know which Papa is actually going to be. Yeah. on the EP because there's no Papa in the video and I have a theory if you're not interested in Ghost Lore, okay. we're on 60 seconds but in a similar vein to how the Seven Inches of Satanic Panic was Papa Nihil back in the 60s in the recent chapters Papa Nihil has become more prominent so I'm wondering if this is maybe him in the 80s and it's kind of a hark back to that maybe so that's my little ghost theory we'll see if I'm right yeah okay yeah we'll see okay moving on Foo Fighters have teased a new video, and in the video, the words, are you thinking what I'm thinking, is overlaid to some music, and so there's obviously hints that it's going to be a new album. They still don't know who's drumming for them, but they are doing a load more shows, headline shows in America Yeah, I saw a few more have been announced. Yeah, and from the 13-second clip, it sounds very much like The Colour and the Shape. Well, that's good. Yeah, they, yeah their best be. album, yeah. yeah. So it be interesting to see what turns out there and who the new drummer's going to be. Yeah, I'd imagine possibly just Dave as a recording drummer might do it himself, but maybe they'll get a touring, a touring drummer. drummer. I don't, it's yeah. a difficult one, isn't know. it? Because they've not announced anything yet, have they, in terms of a touring drummer? No, one person that said they definitely aren't doing it is um, Pearl Jam's drummer. Uh, I can't remember his name. I don't know. I can't remember. Anyway. Uh, my final thing is that Motley Crue and Mick Mars have had a bit of a falling out. Mm. Yeah, so as we know, Mick quit touring from the band about towards the end of last year, wasn't it? I think after the US tour, and they said he wasn't going to come back to do the rest of this year's stint of the tour with Def Leppard. And John Five got brought in to replace him. And we thought that well, was... That's a decent replacement, yeah. Yeah, a decent replacement. And we thought all was well and as it should be and now it turns out that Mick is claiming that he was actually thrown out of the band and Motley have come back and said no and I think it all basically stems back to finances because he's still a 25% shareholder obviously as a founding member of the band and he's now claiming they're trying to write him out of that and apparently there may be a contract that says if you quit then you're 
not you entitled to that. But to then share. he's kind of saying, I think that he only quit the tour inside of it, not recording. And he's also claiming that he, they tried to kick him out since 1987 or something. So, okay, I don't know. It's yeah, gone a little bit quiet now. It's more a few days ago news. Yeah, it's now, quite but, prominent. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously he's had his health issues since forever, really, hasn't he? Bless him. But yeah. Let's we'll wait and see what the turnout is on that one, I guess. Mm. Right, review time, and we have got the highly anticipated album from Metallica, 72 Seasons. Yep. Don't know what else we want to add to that. No, not a lot else we can no. say, really. No. It's, you know, probably one of the most anticipated albums of the year thus far. Would yeah, you say. probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, normally we leave it a little bit longer before we do a review or something, but obviously this was out on Friday, so we got straight on it with this one. Yeah. Out of curiosity, I guess. Yeah, yeah. it's got uh, four singles off it. Lux Eterna, Screaming Suicide, If Darkness Had a Son, and 72 Seasons. And it's just over an hour long. About an hour and 20, I About think. an hour and 20. That's yeah, really for 12 long. tracks. Yeah, it's so really long for 12 tracks. but There's some long tracks on it. Yeah. Should we dive straight into it, then? We may as well, then. So it opens with the title track, 72 Seasons. Mm-hmm. I wasn't sure on this one at first. I didn't actually listen to it as a single. I think I only listened to the first two singles and I thought, no, I'm going to wait for the album, for the other two. Mm. I like it, but I think it's too long. <laughs> I'm not a fan of a long song anyway, as you all know. Yeah. But yeah, I think this could have been maybe half its length. Yeah, I, it, for me, it's pointlessly overlong. And the switches between the six speeds just don't really serve any purpose. Yeah, I kind of liked that. I felt it was kind of... Mixed similar to some the um, Screaming Suicide kind of hints of 90s Metallica yeah. and 80s Metallica merged in, which I do kind of like, but too much of it in this one. Mm. I'm surprised it was a single, actually. Because, mm. I mean, it's, it's really forgettable for me, this. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was a standout. I think the the main reason for me it stands out is it because it's the opening track. Yeah. So it's kind of most memorable because it's usually the one you mm. go to first. Yeah. It's taken the obvious. Right, number two. Yeah, track two, Shadows Follow. I thought this was an improvement over the last track, but it still doesn't grab me and make me want to listen to more. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I really like the intro to this one. And again, yeah, I think it is a, a step up from track one. But again, I did find it too long again. Yeah. There's not enough use of mixing the guitars as well. And it only really happens in kind mm. of like brief periods where you can really spot it. Yeah, there's a lot of instrumental work in there, which is great and all. But we know Metallica can do that. So it feel like you don't need to spend extra minutes showing that. Showing piece. that you can do it, yeah. yeah we know. <laughs> Screaming Suicide, number three, as we've already said, has been a single. We spoke about it before, did we? Yeah, I think a live we've listen a live listened to this one. Yeah. looked at the video. So probably not a lot we can add to this one. I think at the time I said for me this was like if, uh, was it Master of Puppets and and Salmon had a baby, yeah. this would be its child. Yeah, so this was a second single off the album and for me it was kind of like an obvious choice on this because it does feel like old Metallica mm. and James's vocals and... Kirk's stuff kind of alternates and works better than anything else so far. Mm. But it's, yeah, it feels very Master of Puppets era, this. Yeah, I think it is one of my favourites. I don't think there's any real standouts, to be honest, as a whole, but I have got some favourites and this is one yeah, of them. Yeah, this, is one, this mm. is one of them for me too. Uh, track four, Sleepwalk My Life Away. For me, this kind of seems like a song from like a period in the 90s, after the self-titled one, but before Load. Kind of like yeah. if, they, if they could have slotted something in between, it would have been this. yeah. It's just got that kind of sound to me. Yeah, I get what you mean. For me, it was like, not yeah, not quite Black Album, not quite a load. Yeah. I find it quite ploddy, this one. Okay. I mean, I quite like this, but as a new release, it although it's new, it feels dated already because it just feels like it's from a period that it just doesn't belong yeah. in. Or it could have almost been a B-side from one of those, maybe a, yeah. from Load or something. Hmm. Right then, track five, You Must Burn, exclamation mark. For me, this was quite similar to the previous one. It was quite kind of a slower-paced, ploddy, yeah. kind of chuggy. And... Well, I, I actually really like this one. This is actually mm. one of my favourite ones on the album. Okay. Um, and it, it's like the slower dirgyness of it. Kind of, it, it worked really well for me. Mm. And because it's slower as well, it just kind of feels heavier than the others from kind of mm. like a guitar point yeah, of view especially. Yeah. I get that, yeah. Yeah, and so I, I do actually quite like this one. Yeah, so track six, Lux Eterna. Obviously a fast-paced track, obvious choice for the single. Oh, definitely. It's, it's definitely one that kind of stands out really well. It's very catchy, short, short guitar riffs, and the tempo, the kind of the drums, guitars, everything with James's vocals kind of works mm. really well. 
Yeah, I really like this. This is definitely one of my favourites. I know it's the one that I've known the longest, but from the go when they release this. Yeah. I've loved this song. Yeah, like you say, the fast pace of the guitars, the riffs, there's hints of early thrash Metallica that are in yeah. it all the way through. It's just, yeah. And it's stuck in my head now as I'm talking about it. Same here. <laughs> yeah, I've got it go- I've got it going yeah. through my head right now. Um, but I will say, it's a fucking lazy video. Yeah, the two videos I have seen, this one and Screaming Suicide, they were both pretty... Boring. Just, yeah, <laughs> that's added special effects in, but they're, they're no exciting, were they? Nothing about it was exciting, no. but as kind of like as singles go and tracks on the album it is probably one of the best and that's the most important thing because yeah. you don't sit watching the video all day do you number seven crown of barbed wire mm-hmm. i quite like this one i really like the really fast intro to it it reminded me a little bit as well of load era again kind of poor old twisted me that kind of mm. those vibes running through it um i didn't like this i thought it was just really boring huh? and it, for me it just felt like everybody was doing their own thing Mm. on most of the song and there's like there's no cohesion to it for me i don't I mean, what it is about it and it's it feels like they kind of tried to capture all the magic from mm. the self-titled album but yeah. they just created something disjointed so this is probably my least favorite song on the album i think oh interesting yeah interesting that we usually we, we're kind of quite matched on things uh track a chasing light this is another slower track on the album mm. and it works pretty well the single on part in the chorus will probably mm. go down well live. Yeah. I imagine, obviously, they'll be doing stuff off this over the download weekend. Potentially the whole album may be six tracks and I, I don't know. Yeah, it could be. And I feel like this is probably going to be a midpoint in the set. Yeah. It, it feels like that kind of track. Yeah, it did to me a kind of mid-ish point or the middle section of the album. And yeah. Then similar placement for the live show. Yeah, I thought this one was okay. Yeah. It was... It's not. It's not horrible. Um, no, like you say, that single on chorus works well in it. Um, yeah, and yeah, I, th- I think that's kind of what they've designed that for. Yeah. Number nine, if darkness had a son, which was another single, as we said earlier. Yeah. I quite like this one. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's more. It's got quite a moody opening, and yeah. it builds and layers well right at the start. Yeah, mood is a good word. I was trying to. Yeah. Think how, I couldn't think how to describe it, but yeah, moody captures it. I think. But it goes on for far too long. Yeah, that was going to be my next point as well. It's another one that is longer than it needs to be. Yeah. And it, it feels a lot dirtier than the other tracks too. Mm. And it, it makes sense that it's a single. And it seems like a, almost like an updated Master of Puppets era again. Mm. So it, it does work, but I think it, it just... It, it just does go on for far too long. There's no need for it. Yeah, I think we've already said, but it's definitely kind of overriding sense of that throughout yeah. the album which i think that the album as a whole the time length sums it up doesn't it yeah uh track 10 too far gone again it's a, a track that might go down well live but it just feels a bit boring to me and the chorus is catchy but it doesn't really save it and it just feels inconsistent and there's lots of meandering little solos mm. for no reason yeah it's interesting you said that because i kind of i, I like parts of it and not the part i like the chorus yeah but like you say, some of it is just, yeah, meandering. Yeah. Kind of disjointed, I like that bit, but not that bit. And you almost want to pick bits out and maybe pick a bit from another song. And... Yeah, it does feel like this album is very much mm. like that. It's like, I don't dislike it. It's not offensive on the ears, but I don't like all of it. Yeah. So number 11, Room of Mirrors. I think, yeah, this one's kind of picking up again. This one's more, felt more cohesive, Yeah, I think, overall. Yeah, the, for me, this is a much better track, mm. and this track is more like the album I would have wanted. Yeah. You know, it's got really quick tempos, an intro that's not too long, really rasping quick, punishing vocals, and it's the best track on the album for me, I think. Nothing's really overplayed for, you know, unwarranted reasons, and it mm. feels a lot stronger as a result of that. Yeah. And I wish it was... 12 tracks of this kind of thing mm. instead instead of it being fragmented through the album. Okay, yeah. I, I wouldn't say it was one of my favourites on the album, but it is definitely a more a consistent one. And yeah. again, it's, it's not overlong, overplaying or any of that. It's just... Yeah, it's just, it's, it's just right. Just right, yeah. yeah. And final track, In a Marata. I really like this one. Okay. I know it is the longest one, but yeah, this is actually one of my favourites. It's just parts of it that I really, really like. And as a whole, again, I think for me, it's apart from the two singles that I mentioned. Yeah. 
this is my favourite, I think. Okay. I, you see, I've got a real issue with this. I mean, mm. it's a strange choice to end on anyway, I think. Mm. Um, it's 11 minutes long, and they could have done it in three or four. I and, get that, yeah. Yeah. And it, it just seems like such a self-indulgent move. And it, it feels like it's stuck on loop. I know you know <laughs> that. I think it's because I do really like it, and I like... I really like the vocals in this one. Yeah. So because I like it, it doesn't actually feel overlong, triggering my dopamine. <laughs> this one is, whereas the other ones, I'm just like, yeah, I'm bored now. Nothing's triggered. Yeah, this one, it's like, oh, yes. I, I think if this had been kind of four minutes long, it would have been incredible. Yeah. But I, it just feels like it's on loop. Mm-hmm. And it, if, you know, if you condensed it, I think it would have been absolutely incredible. And it's a radio edit, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I have to say, if they do play this live, I may get bored live. Otherwise, come <laughs> around, yeah, here we go, <laughs> going round again. A bit like when you're on a big wheel and you think you're going to get off, but no, it goes round again. <laughs> but no, I, I do like it yeah. as a whole. So, come on, what's your summary of the album? What do you kind of think then? I don't think it's lived up to his hi- its hype. I don't think it's met the expectation I had initially when they released Lux Eterna. Mm. But I was kind of expecting that after Screaming Suicide. Yeah. Because that was... I like that one, as I said. It's a favourite, but again, it's, it wasn't up there with Luxoderna. I'm not going to say I'm disappointed, but it hasn't met my expectations. Yeah. Like a, a souffle that's not gone flat, but it's not risen to its full souffle <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's like many of my school reports. It's got potential, but could have done a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> It's got overly long intros and songs, mm. and some of the stuff sounds dated already. And so for me, it won't go down as a classic album. It's better than the last few releases, because, I mean, things like Death Magnetic, I absolutely hate and it. I, I don't mind that. And, yeah, it, it just doesn't compare to their earlier work, which mm. I think they're trying to recapture. Yeah, definitely. Like we say, there's, there's hints of the previous Metallica 80s, 90s littered throughout. Yeah. It. And, you know, at least 30 minutes could have been shaved off of this. Yeah, um, and it's like, again, we said at the start, you don't need to show us that you can play the instruments that yeah, we, well. We know you can. We know you can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so bearing all of that in mind, for me, I'm probably going to say seven. I'm, I'm seven. a seven as well. I think the first time round, I was kind of verging on a six because I was kind of listening to it in the background while doing things and there weren't any standout tracks jumping at me apart yeah. from the ones I knew. But the more I've listened to it, it has grown. I yeah. think it's one that you do, I think because the length of the song, you have to keep listening and working out what's what and registering yeah. the different tracks as well and not getting bored of them. Some of yeah. Them. yeah, a solid seven. Main feature time. So we are going to be at Uprising at the O2 Academy in Leicester. And this is going to be kind of like a preview of who are going to be playing a little bit about the venue and the history of the festival. It's on the 29th of April at the O2 Academy in Leicester, and it's an absolute bargain of a price. I think it's £35 plus fees, and there's a hell of a lot of bands you'll get to watch. Doors open around 12.30. Yep, it's preceded by a pre-party on Friday the 28th at the Firebug in Leicester. Tickets for that one are £10. And if you go to that one, you get to see Ritual King, Tribe of Ghosts, and the headliners, Party Cannon. Yeah, for a ton of that's an absolute steal, isn't it? Yeah. That's, that's a really good price. And they've also got a DJ on until 4am if you're that way inclined. That way inclined so, <laughs> yeah. To then get up and have a full day of a festival on Saturday. Yeah. So about the venue. So there's two stages. There's the main academy and Academy 2, which are going to alternate between bands. And the venue, well, the festival itself actually started in De Montford in 2016 and then moved to the O2 in 2019, where it's been ever since. Yeah, obviously they had to have a break during the pandemic, as everything in the world did. But this is the sixth iteration of the festival. And the bands on this list are amazing. We've seen one of the bands already on this list, Palm Reader, who we are big fans of. So let's move on to some of the things that you can expect to see. So the event actually kicks off with the Leicester Metal to the Masses final in the Academy 2. So there are going to be four bands performing to get a place at Bloodstock on the new Blood stage this year. Semi-final one has already happened and the winners of that were Inflictions and Running With Knives. And semi-final two is this upcoming weekend, so we don't know who the other two bands will be yet. 
but yeah, there'll be four bands battling it out on there. So I highly recommend that you get there. I think the starting time is around one o'clock. So definitely get there early so you can support these new and upcoming bands before the kind of main event, yeah. as it were. We'll definitely be there checking all these four bands out. Yeah, because if it's anything like the quality of the Nottingham metal to the masses, then you're in for an absolute treat. Definitely. And as you know, with all of our recommendations and other bands that we mentioned, we're big advocates of supporting new bands. Yeah. So. Right, so moving on then to the bands on the poster. Not in any particular order, we're just kind of working our way up towards the headliners. Yeah. So first up then we have Lowen, who are a two-piece Middle Eastern prog doom band. They are a male-female combo with Nina on vocals and playing the folk instruments and Shem on guitar and bass. And they are joined by a couple of other musicians on their live shows. They've got two releases so far. They've got A Crypt in the Stars, which was their debut album back in 2018. And then more recently, they released Unceasing Lamentations in 2021, which is a three-track acoustic-based EP. And they sing in a variety of languages, primarily English and Farsi. But on Unceasing Lamentations, there are also tracks in the ancient languages Sumerian and Akkadian. Hope I've pronounced that right. So they have got a very unique sound and I'm really looking forward to seeing them live. Nina's got an amazing vocal, so I really can't wait to hear that in person. Next up, we've got Internal Conflict, who are a five-piece metalcore band, and they're also a former Ready to Mush recommendation. They are. So it's going to be fun watching those guys live. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, really looking forward to that. Their latest album was out in 2021 called Deporia. So we've recommended them before, so definitely go and check those out if you're going to Uprising. Next up then we have Blood Oath, who are a kind of black and death thrash band. They've got a couple of albums out. They were formed in 2015 and were invited to go on to the 2016 Metal to the Masses in Leicester. Didn't get through that time, but continued playing around the local area for the next year or so. And then entered again in 2017, actually won a place on the New Blood stage that year. Mm -hmm. Their debut album, Kingdom of Dead Souls, was released in 2017. And then the second album was Infernal Rex Diabolus in 2019. And I'd definitely say they are for fans of kind of behemoth and that kind of sound. Yeah, definitely that so, kind of vibe from them. Yeah, if you're into that noise, which I am, <laughs> go and make sure you check them out alongside the others. Next up, we've got Hawks, who are an uh, old metal band. Uh, they're a four-piece. They're based in London, but they're actually originally from Greece, Wales, England and Italy. It's quite a, Yeah, it's quite a diverse, multicultural kind of lineup there. And yeah, lots of harmonies kind of mixed with a lot of heavy riffs and uh, really cool drums. Last year, they had a huge tour that they went across the UK, Ireland, Holland. Towards in Toronto, playing Download, Radar Fest, Great Escape, Burn It Down Festival. And they've also played the HMAs as well. So the, their stock level is definitely rising. They're, uh, they're going to definitely be one to watch. And I'm sure there's a lot more to come from them. Next, then, we have Boss Keloid, who are a heavy prog kind of psychedelic rock band. They've been around quite a while now, actually. They've got five studio albums. Their debut, Angular Beef Lesson, was released in 2011. That's a great name. They have got some really interesting titles, actually, amongst their releases. Their other ones to note are the 2016 album, Herb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And the most recent album from 2021 is Family the Smiling Thrush. <laughs> yeah, very interesting titles. Yeah, they've got a really heavy kind of doomy sound lots of cool yeah. bass going on there really awesome vocal so and they've got some really good live reviews that i've seen they've just actually done a little tour across the uk in march so you may have already caught them live but from the reviews that i've read they're definitely going to be ones to check out uh next up we've got uh Damim, who are london based and they're kind of a i don't know how to this best to describe it kind of like a death thrash progressive kind of extreme sound so if you if you like heavier stuff, these are definitely going to do it for you. Their last album, A Fine Game of Nil, was out in 2019. And yeah, if you, if you want something that's just going to make your ears bleed, these are definitely going to do it. They absolute, sound absolutely amazing from what I've listened to so far. And I'm really looking forward to seeing these live. Same, yeah. Next up, we've got Scarlet Riot, who are a four-piece kind of classic hard rock sound from Scunthorpe. These have actually been around for a while. Um, didn't really come on my radar until Bloodstock last year. Yeah, I think that's where I kind of picked up on them. Mm. 
Yeah, they played the main stage there last year, but they've been going since 2010 when they released their first EP. And they've now got three albums, plus a few other EPs in their discography. So debut album was Tear Me Down from 2013. And their most recent one is Invicta, which was released in 2021. That one saw them get to number 14 in the Independent Album Breakers chart in the UK. And also saw them at number three in the Amazon chart, number four in the iTunes Metal chart. Chart. So obviously they kind of seem like they've been bubbling away for quite a while now, but they're really starting to pick up. They did a huge tour last year supporting Mushroom Head across the UK and EU in June, as well as their appearance at Bloodstock and a few other festivals. So yeah, really looking forward to getting to check them out at Uprising. Okay, next up we've got Sir, which I believe is the correct pronunciation. It's actually a one-man piece, and I'm really interested to see how this kind of works because it's so heavily layered, there's so much stuff going on in it, and it's going to be really cool to check out. So it's kind of black metal meets folk, and it's really interesting to listen to. So I'm really intrigued to see how that plays out, and how that goes down. me too, from what I've heard on audio. It's going to be interesting to watch. Next up then is Combi Christ, who are Agrotech Industrial, and they've been around quite some time now, 20 years this year, I believe. That's it. A hell of a long time. Yeah, I actually came across these about about five years ago, I think. Yeah, it was. Because they did a tour with Wednesday 13, the US tour, and then European tour. Um, so I was just curious what they sounded like from that, really. Yeah. And I feel like we've almost come a little bit full circle on this because we were supposed to see Wednesday 13 at the O2 in Leicester last year. We were, yeah. And that got cancelled. And now we're seeing Combi Christ there, who I came across because of Wednesday. So it's a weird circle of life, as Elton would say. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so they are led by Andy La Plegua. I hope I said that right. Who's a Norwegian who's now living in the US. They're kind of just him, really, in a way. Over the years, it's kind of he's been the main recording force behind the band. There's been different band members come in. He's used touring musicians. I think at the moment they're kind of a five piece, but it seems to be like an ever changing, revolving door of bands. You know, when you look on the old timeline of band members yeah. and stuff. So, so they've got nine studio albums now under their belt, starting with the Joy of Guns back from two thousand and three, and then their most recent release was One Fire from twenty nineteen. In terms of their sound, if you like things like Skinny Puppy. Three Teeth, those kind of bands, and you'll definitely love these guys. Which is definitely up my street. Absolutely. To me as well, because they've got that kind of techno, underground, heavy kind of electronic bass going through. They're almost a bit of a hybrid of Ramstein and later Prodigy stuff. Yeah. That makes sense. But yeah, lots of banging tunes and bass and drums and beats going on. They're billing it as an old school set. So obviously their older stuff is going to be out there. And they're currently actually on tour in the UK, pretty much as we speak, I think, or around this time. And they were actually at Nottingham. But when I saw they were on the lineup for Uprising, I thought, well, I'm going to see them there anyway. Yeah. So yeah, they're doing the rounds at the moment. Like I say, they've been around a long time, but for some reason haven't seen them yet. So I cannot wait to see this set. Next up, we've got Palm Reader, who are a former Ready to Mosh recommendation. And we've also seen live at Mangata last year. Yeah, I think they're the only band that we've seen live. They are, from this, from this current bill, yeah. Mm. And yeah, they are a great band. Uh, kind of like post-hardcore sound. And can't wait to see them live again. I'd strongly recommend anybody listen to Hold Release, which was the first track from Sleepless. Yeah, I think that's my favourite track of theirs, yeah. actually. Yeah which was their last album out in 2020. So they must be working on something new, I think. Yeah, I think they'll probably do something. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to seeing those guys again. Yeah. And finally, then, we have the headliners of the festival, Paradise Lost. Absolute goth metal doom legends that they are. Yeah. For some absolute reason, unknown to anybody. I don't know how I've not seen them live before now. Yeah, I don't get that either, because they've... They've been around a hell of a long time. I know. I remember talking about these at school, which is a very long time ago. (laughs) I never listened to them then because, as we've said before, back in the day, you didn't have access to music that you weren't familiar with. So they kind of passed me by. Yeah. I think I probably started listening to them a bit in the early noughties and then they kind of faded in and out of my vision. Yeah, I, I did very much the same as you. But yeah, the first album was released back in 1990, so 33 years ago. Yeah, it's a long time, long, long yeah. time. And I believe they've done about 16 studio albums now. So an epic back catalogue. So how they will ever pick a set list from that, well, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> that, that's going to be some achievement, isn't it? But I'm sure they're used to it by now. 
Yeah, so, I mean, they've influenced so many people. My Dying Bride, Cradle of Filth, Catatonia, not the Welsh Catatonia, the, the other Catatonia. The Swedish Catatonia? Yeah. <laughs> Lacuna Coil, him, you know, so it's an amazing headliner to get. Mm. I think I think Uprising have done a great job, all of the bands on the bill. And, yeah, I think what's great about these as well is that it's pretty much the original lineup. Yeah. It's been together since 88. Yeah, I think, is it just the drummer that they've kind of had a few of, but the rest of the band have pretty yeah. much stayed consistent throughout? Yeah, so like we said, it's um, going to be great to finally watch them live. Yeah. So I don't know how we've, I really don't know how we've missed them. I don't either. I'm pretty sure I've not seen them and forgot about it. So, yeah. <laughs> that is always the danger, isn't it, with us? It is, but I'm absolutely sure because I think if I had seen them, it would have been with you and you don't remember either. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I really can't wait to see these legends at last. And that's the Uprising Festival lineup. Right, it's recommendation time this week. And rather than us recommending a band as we normally would do, we're actually just going to recommend the whole of Uprising Festival to you. Hopefully the little overview that we've just done gave you an insight into all of the bands that are going to be playing there. As you can see, there's a variety of different music styles going on, so there should be something for everybody. So we highly recommend that if you've not already got a ticket, that you go and get some. As we mentioned at the start, it's £35 plus fee, so just under £40. So... If you have got the chance to get a ticket, it's with the Metal to the Masses bands as well, it's looking at, what, less than £3 per band, which is a bargain. So this is kind of an overview and a build-up and preview to Uprising. And we're going to be doing a full review once we've been and seen and enjoyed all of these bands. Hopefully we're going to have a couple of mini mosh episodes in the build-up to this as well with some very special guests. So keep an eye out for those too. Yep, so if you are planning to go to Uprising, do let us know and we might see you there. Right, well, that's the end of episode 55 then. So thank you, as always, for listening. Do give us a like, follow and share on all of our social media places if you're not doing so already. We're on Instagram and Twitter at Ready to Mosh Cast and TikTok, Facebook and YouTube at Ready to Mosh. Also, don't forget to leave us a review if you enjoyed this episode and you enjoy listening to the podcast. Give us a share, recommend, etc. And we'll be back next time with episode 56. Make it stop, Merg.